and say contemporary thinking on race. So far, almost all of what I've said has been largely uncontroversial, all right? You may not agree with me at every point, but we're going to talk about two contemporary questions that my neighbors and your neighbors are probably asking, which means that I'm going to wade into uh, landmine territory, and uh, I, I don't mind doing it, right? And there are going to be things I'm going to say that probably frustrate you, that I think, frust- you know, you might say things that frustrate me, but we're Christians, and we're going to love each other, and we're not going to forget the nature of our salvation, the nature of this society that Jesus created, And the fact that the purpose of our work tonight is to think and love for the sake of our neighbors, right? So that's what we're doing. So the questions are twofold. Do all lives matter or do black lives matter? That's the first question, right? And that's what our neighbors are asking. And then second, what is critical race theory? And uh, I have not been able to dedicate any time at all to reading a more contemporary question about Asian American experiences lately, which has been something WAPO and New York Times and others have been reporting on, so I cannot touch that because I have not read on that, okay? Uh, So if you ask questions, I'm just going to delete them, not because I don't think they're important, but because I try to discipline myself to not talk about things I don't know. All right, so we're going to take each one of these in turn, and uh, we'll say this. Okay, do black lives matter? Can Christians say that? I'm going to thread a needle here, and by the grace of God, we're going to grow in faith and in love for one another and for our neighbors, okay? The short answer is, I think, Christians may say it at the very least, but I don't think they must say it. I don't think that they, I'm being very careful to say, I don't think they should say it. I don't think that they can say it, but I think that Christians are free in the Lord. Romans 14, Colossians 2, these sorts of things are influencing my mind. They may say it at the very least. When I'm, I'm, that at the very least is also very important, but we as Christians also have a value added that we have to bring to the, con- to the conversation to offer what I think is a countercultural witness, which I want to propose today. The question, do black lives matter, was brought up to the forefront in our political and social discussions, uh, particularly by the Black Lives Matter movement. And what they found, uh, you know, um, and where this came, came into be was social conversations on social media since February 16th of 2012. And we can chart it because you can go on Twitter and still find these. When George Zimmerman confronted Trayvon Martin late one night, in exchange that left Trayvon Martin dead. That's when Black Li- hashtag Black Lives Matter first appeared on Twitter. Scholars have studied the, the impact that social media has on social movements, and in particular, the Black Lives Matter movement. What they found is that the more likely individuals are networked on social media, the more likely they are, they are able to be mobilized into a trend. And that's why Christopher LeBron called hashtag Black Lives Matter, quote, a social movement brand that can be picked up and deployed by any interested group of active activists inclined to speak out or act out uh, against racial injustice. And Christopher LeBron is uh, the historian of the movement. This book that he's, uh, he's quoting from was published by Oxford, and he teaches at Princeton. So when he's saying this, he's not saying as like a yokel, like he really knows what he's talking about. His point is that Black Lives Matter, because it exists in social media, it can be used in a variety of ways by a variety of people, and it means different things to each person because it's democratic, because it exists on social media. So while there is a Black Lives Matter Inc., not everybody who is saying Black Lives Matter on Twitter is a member of that Black Lives Matter Inc. That's LeBron's point, okay? And that's where this, uh, this kind of goes, because I think an objection to what I just said it can be immediately raised. Uh, the organization Black Lives Matter is a Marxist revolutionary group seeking to upend and destroy the nuclear family, which is true. You could go onto their website about four years ago. I think it's been taken down since then, but the rhetoric is still the same, especially when you read uh, some books on like how to be anti-racist, and you see things about needing to dismantle the... Um, the, uh, the, 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 the heteronormity of our society, for example, that, that only men and women can get married, those sorts of things are still present in the rhetoric. Um, and, and that does, in fact, trace its route, its, its, its intellect, an intellectual history back to Karl Marx, who originally in Das Kapital and in Com- Communist Manifesto argued that the nuclear family is the tool of oppression, that it keeps women oppressed, and it keeps workers oppressed. And so if you dismantle the nuclear family, then you can, you can remake society, okay? So yes, that organization does exist, right? Sure. 
But Christians can offer some real hope here, and that's what I'm holding out. We can offer in this, in this cultural moment, maybe not in 10 years, maybe not 10 years ago, but in this moment that God has called us for such time as this to live in this moment, we can offer some real hope by not immediately running to all lives matter. I'm not saying all lives don't matter, but I'm saying that there's a moment here that we can, we can offer some gospel hope. I want you to lean in here, okay? Because whether you believe it's a valid question or not, there is an open question in the black community. Do I matter to anyone outside of my community? And the answer for them is, of course I do. I'm a man, right? I've already mentioned it, but you can hear it in Frederick Douglass's What is the 4th of July to a Slave? You can hear it when Harriet Tubman is, she's leading human beings through Kentucky. And they're being chased by dogs trying to get to the Ohio where these people who are running away are asking the question, do I not matter to anyone? Why do they have dogs on me? Right? You can hear it when, when you're Ida B. Wells arguing that human beings should not be lynched from trees. Do we not matter? When you hear Du Bois and the frustration in his souls of black folks, you hear it in Marcus Garvey when, sure, he's dressed up in a funny way, but he's giving dignity to human beings trying to say, yes, you do matter, right? Or you have it in Reverdy Ransom, who Reverdy Ransom actually is from Chicago and almost got lynched just north in North Huntsville. Uh, he came down to speak at a conference He's invited by William Council, who uh, the park downtown had just been named for, has just been named for. And uh, people found out that he was coming to town, thought of him as an, as an agitator. They, they met him in Chase, Alabama, which is now Huntsville, but it's in North Huntsville. Beat him up on a train, tried to lynch him. He got away, stayed in a hotel in, in Huntsville. And uh, nobody talked to him. Nobody came for him. And so he got right back on a train and went right back home. So this, this intersects here. Right? You hear it in Father Divine, and in his religious movement, he's trying to create this charismatic, unchristian Christian movement, right? And you hear it, you hear it in the Memphis sanitation strike, where, where people are protesting their working conditions, and they're having to shout to people, I am a man, right? Right? You hear, you hear it with King on the mountaintop when he's saying, I've seen to the I've seen the other side, right? So he knows, and he dies the next day after this. He gets shot the next day after that photo. Right? You can, you can hear it in James Cone, right? And in, in his The Cross and Lynching Tree. You can hear it in, in Cornell West and his history of African American religion. You can hear it in people like Kimberly Crenshaw and Susan Collins, who, who these people are trying to ask this question Does my life matter to anyone outside of my community? And here's the deal don't agree with Cone on his liberation theology, and I think that Crenshaw's intersectionality is an un. A, a, Christians cannot make mental ascent to intersectionality. But underneath their writings is a clear question. And, and all those faces I just showed, it's a clear question. Do black lives matter to anyone who is not black? That's the question that they're asking, right? In that question, black lives matter. It's of, you might say, of course they do. And, and you might say, well, I've never, I've never hated anyone. But it doesn't really matter what you per se individually have done if there is a corporate question that your neighbor is asking, do I matter? Of course they do. And I'm positing to you that there's a gospel opportunity here. God has called us in his providence for such a time as this. Uh, you know, Esther 4 is not just for Esther, it's for us too. And there's a moment in time in history where we live, where there's a question where human beings are asking, do I matter? And you have the best option, the best opportunity to say, yes, you do matter. And you have an obligation to say that because you're made in the image of God. God created, God created this life and it matters. Black, but, but then you, you have to add, because you're a Christian, you have to add, not just black lives matter, that's th that you may say that at least, but if you say that, you must say the value added that Christians bring to the conversation is because they're made in the image of God. They don't just matter because I say they matter or because I'm applying the sword to make them matter, but they matter because God has spoken and they say that he says that they matter. You know, when your, neighbor, when your neighbor's looking across the, the deathbed of their child in deep anguish and asks you if there's life after death, you answer yes. But you can't just leave it at yes. You say yes, God is the God of the living. All who die will be raised to life in the end and hidden in Christ. Your child is in the arms of God. No more lymphoma. 
And if we go back to the origin of racial thinking that we just covered, philosophers and naturalists and even some theologians wondered if people of African descent were even human beings at all. And we just talked about that. When Carl Linnaeus is breaking that up and when, when Peschel and the University of Leipzig is, is drawing that map, it is an open question. I didn't, I didn't show it to you. I'm going to go back and show it to you. Does anybody see um, that green in India? The green in India is the, the German there literally says kind of just beneath the dirt, which in German, I, I, it, that's literally what it says, but it kind of just means totally uncategorizable, right? But that's not like we couldn't place them. It's just there's something other than human was the point, right? So it, it's, it's not, people have this question, and why would we, if we're wondering how in the world are we going to communicate the gospel when the world seems to be post-Christian, if your neighbor is asking you, does this life matter? You can say yes. It's, it matters because it's made in the image of God. Well, what does that mean? It's a, it's a door. Don't shut the door, please, right? Open the door and walk through it and share the gospel. So it's our duty to love our neighbor. Our duty to love our neighbor requires us to listen to the questions they're asking and not to dismiss them categorically because we think we might, on, we might already know the answer. So to be clear, I don't think Christians should only say Black Lives Matter. I think they may say it. I don't think they have to say it. I don't think they must say it. And they can't only say it, right? I think we ought to hold out our value added in our witness because we, we're not answering the question Black Lives Matter because we've assented to a metaphysical decision. We're saying Black Lives Matter because we have a Bible and we've opened it and we said, yeah, it, it says they matter because they're made in the image of God right, right here. All children of Adam are made in the image of God. They matter because God has knit them together in the womb. Jesus died to redeem black lives. And they matter because I'm their brother in Adam. So by virtue of my union with Christ, this is wild. But if we understand salvation, it doesn't bother us at all. I have more intimate fellowship and relationship and friendship with my brother in Africa who lived 50 years ago, is currently dead. I've never met than I do with my current family members alive who are not in vital union with the, with the living God. I have, more, I have more in common with them, right? And if they feel like they have to say their lives matter to claim dignity that is their birthright by virtue of being created by God, I'm okay with that. I'm just going to hold out the why. I'm, I'm going to push you to say why. Like, yeah, you can say that, and I'm fine with you saying but let me tell you why your life matters. Let me offer the Bible to you and say Jesus says that your life has infinite worth, that God loved you so much that he gave his son for you, right? That's, that's what we're doing, right? So now the how, right? The how. How do we do that? How does our neighbor get to that point? And then how do we kind of get around that point, right? Here's the big one, right? What is critical race theory and intersectionality? All right, critical race theory originated in legal studies as a way to advance issues related to civil rights. Critical race theory originated in legal studies as a way to advance issues of civil rights. To say that the law kind of, the, the law doesn't equally protect everyone in every circumstance was kind of the aim, right? In the kind of, uh, kind of textbook of that, you can see in your footnote there. Intersectionality, however, is slightly different. It's, a, it's kind of a cousin or, or a granddaughter, perhaps, of critical race theory, and it's, it's a framework. It's a framework. So a framework is, is kind of like a structure that goes on the inside of a thing that you're going to try to mold something around. If I'm making a sculpture, I need to have a frame around which I put all of my molding clay, right? So it's a framework, intersectionized, employed to describe the axes of identity that comprise who we are, right? And these characteristics can bisect, or if I had more arms, I would illustrate trisect, and they can do that ad infinitum. So as many characteristics as you could think of, there is an intersection that would bisect or at some point cross the line, and that point of all those intersections is your identity. And the identity of everyone around you is somewhere else on that spectrum of points. Kimberly Crenshaw is the individual who coined intersectionality, but the concept predates her by at least 20 years. It was uh, the, the idea was, uh, was put forward at least by a person named Francis Beale in Double Jeopardy to be black and female, which captured the essence of Crenshaw's 
observation acutely 20 years before Crenshaw published her journal article. Crenshaw's uh, desire was that when, when race, class, and gender studies began to be accepted as disciplines within the academy, they lost their kind of critical edge. They lost their ability to wage culture war. So when, you know, when feminist theory in the 1960s is making advances in its own kind of arguments, and, uh, and then it's legitimized by, giving, by being given a department in a university by saying that this, this is so real, we're going to just put it here. Crenshaw said it kind of it lost its force because like now it lives in the same pot that causes all the problems to begin with, right? So Crenshaw kind of um, observed this, and other people observed this as well. The intersection is more than like a buzzword. It's, its desire from the beginning is to take these whether it's race, gender, or class studies out of their discipline in the academy and then put them back kind of at an activist edge. And the way they do that, the way they kind of overcome that domestication is to show how these various things pit against one another, okay? So does that make sense? That the, the, way, you would, the way you would advance the kind of criticism you need to advance kind of a social uh, uh, reconstruction is to pull these places out of the place that domesticated them and put them back in a place where they're back in conflict with people and conflict with ideas to push the conversation forward, right? Some, some scholars are even advancing it as, as a unifying theory for social sciences to reignite the activist legacies of their respective disciplines. So those are our definitions of the ideas. And they present an intellectual challenge to Christian orthodoxy on two, on two counts, okay? The first is, I think if Christians do decide, I think they're free in the Lord, Romans 14, to say it or not to say it, okay? If they do decide to say and embrace Black Lives Matter as a movement, right, they are not free, I believe, to embrace critical race theory and intersectionality, okay? The second is related. Both of those ideas that are in the conversation require the mental ascent of an idea on top of that idea. So if they're gonna say, I support intersectionality, you have to also say that the thing above intersectionality is also true, okay? I'm going to illustrate this in just a second, and I'll say more about it in just a second as well. Let's talk about the first challenge itself, and then I'll talk about those two reasons, okay? Critical race theory and intersectionality occupy a slice of the academy called critical theory, and I'm going to plead with you one more time. We're about to go deeper. So we were knee-high earlier. We're going to be like chest-high, all right? But these are your neighbors, and you love them, and Christ died to purchase them. So do the hard work with me. We're going to do it together, and then you can watch it on YouTube, okay? And uh, I will help you. I love, I love the people that are asking these questions because it means that they care. I'm so tired of, of people that don't care anymore. I'm done with apathy. And uh, even if my neighbors are advancing something I think is anti-gospel, I'm, I'm glad that I can engage in a conversation with them. Uh, so... Do this with me, okay? Uh, so we're, we're doing this a little bit more, and critical theory has influenced every subject in the academy now in the last 10 to 15 years. So if you're college, if you have a college kid uh, and, and you have college-age children, you can, you can probably tell a difference between the kid who first went into college 10 years ago, maybe seven years ago, and the child who might be in college now and the type of things that they're saying in advancing. I, this is a, that's a total guess, but I think it's a very informed guess. And part of the reason is, is because this is, this is moved from, from just being that thing that plucks these out to that grand unifying theory of, of, of society, right? And we, we have to deal with this because critical theory influences everything, okay, in the academy now. And, the, and I think it was inevitable because it originally started in the discipline of the study of language. That's a blank there, in the study of language. And the fact that the implications and the questions start with language, that makes it poignant to Christians. Because we are a people of the book, anytime people say things about language, speech, or hermeneutics, we have to pay particular attention. Because a book is God's self-revelation in our confession. So when we have a critical theory that tries to deconstruct the words that we're reading, we have to deal with that and we have to hit it head on, okay? To help us a little bit, I want to introduce you to a guy named Jack, okay? Jack doesn't have a face because he didn't 
He didn't uh, render properly, but that's okay, all right? The, uh, when, I'm kind of glad about this, too, because Jack originally looked more like me than I wanted him to. Uh, but now that he doesn't, you know, it's okay, right? All right. So I want to introduce you to Jack, who uh, lives in an alternate world where there is nothing other than him. So all that is is Jack and, for now, this pencil. We're going to add more things to Jack's world here in a second, but this is all there is, right? And in the West, since the time of Greek philosophers, all that you saw, right, was concrete and grounded in reality. So that pencil that he was holding is real, and it's real in two ways, right? You can see the pencil itself. You can see its shapes and its features, right? You can see the color. What color is that pencil? Blue. You guys are smart. I'm not being, I'm not being facetious. The, talking to the Wellers over there and the kind of people that come to an event like this, I respect you so much, right? So you see the color blue, and the fact that it is blue was called by the Greeks an accident. Now, it's not an accident in the sense that you, you have like a boo-boo and make an accident. It's you, it's called the accident of its thing, right? So it is the, the thing itself has these qualities which are accidents, which can be confusing because it wasn't made blue on accident. Now, I purposefully made Jack's pencil blue, right? But now Jack has a little more of his face. That's good news. Uh, and he now has a what color pencil, right? A yellow pencil. So the accident of his pencil has changed, but you recognize it as a pencil because the essence of the pencil has not changed. So if I switch back and forth, if you looked at that and you had no idea what a pencil was, you would think, oh, this is an entirely different thing. But because you have a concept of pencil, you know what the essence of pencil is, you can recognize that, oh, the accidents have changed, but that's a pencil. It can write. So you totally understand this. Its form has not changed. It's still a pencil. And the way you recognize those features that make a pencil a pencil are your senses. So as Jack moves through the world, right, as he moves through his society, right, he's putting his senses to work to understand his surroundings, the accidents of his various uh, 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 surroundings. So all of those things have the essence of a building, but even though the accents are different, he knows that they're all buildings, right? You can all understand this, I think. Jack is moving through the world because he's trying to help his dad, Robert, who's in the middle of a, cri of a crisis. Robert, he's a middle manager, and uh, he, he doesn't love his life. And uh, to, try to, to try to enjoy life a little bit more, he got a subscription to Audible. He's listening to philosophy books on the way to work. He's stuck in traffic, and he's questioning whether or not he even exists, right? He doesn't know if the line he's seeing is red because it is actually red, because the accident is red, or because he has said that it's red? Like, is it red because it is actually red, or is it red because he has just said it, and now he sees it, right? Jack is headed there to tell his dad that, that the, 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 he can trust his senses because God has created the world in such a way that it can be known and seen. Jack has even more of his face. Now, this is good news for Jack. Maybe by the end of it, we'll have a whole Jack, okay? Uh, in a way that, that the red line is red, not because he says it's red, and not because the accident is red, but because God has created that red line. So the fact that it's red is because it exists in the mind of God mainly, right? So Jack is a Christian. He's explaining, Dad, this is how we think. This is how Christians have thought forever. That line is red because God says it's red, and it doesn't really matter if you called it blue. It would still be red. And my pencil is blue right now because God has made it blue. But also he created the form of pencil, essence of pencil. So if I called this pencil uh, a pen or a ruler, it would not change because whatever I decree is not what actually makes a thing be, okay? Now, these are all simple. You guys are still with it. But Robert, Robert is struggling, okay? Robert is going, he's thinking about his community. He's like, oh no. Oh no, he's reflecting on the world as he knows it, because at the end of the 19th century, philosophers begin to think of the world as a projection of words. And this, this is a blank for you, this speech is what created society, right? So, so he knows that for a long time, people assumed, right, all that was, all that could be seen, felt, tasted, and even that had an origin, had its origin from some intelligent mind which made it. 
So when Robert's reflecting on this, he knows, you know, until about the 19th century, everybody just knew, maybe they didn't call it God, maybe they called it being, maybe they called it just uh, the unmovable mover, uh, that was Aristotle, but there was some mind that gave us this world, right? But new philosophers, they begin to talk about the world in such a way that all that was, was, was created by speech. It was created from below. And that is, uh, the, these, these things, these, in, in its crudest description, is, is structuralism. That, that, that the speech that we have creates worlds. So ra- the, the difference is, is very profound. I need to return to it to make sure you know. The turn in, in language, in the philosophy of language, is exceptionally critical for us. When in philosophy, people switch from thinking of the world as created from God and received, like Locke said earlier when I talk about John, Jonathan Edwards, it comes into our mind from outside of our mind, right? When we begin to talk about the world as coming out of our mind, we've departed the realm of what had always been in Christian philosophy, all right? Now, this is critical because if language creates societies, then it's also a projection of power because whoever gets to talk gets to create the world. Does, that follow? Does everybody follow? So when voices are silenced, they don't get to create a world to live in. Does that make sense? Everybody kind of tracking with that, all right? So there's a lot of, and, and the reaction to structuralism, the reaction to, to this is called deconstruction. And it's in that tradition to look at this and say, well, how do we take that structure and look at the power and disordered power? How do we deconstruct and get to that power in order to understand where it went wrong and rebuild something else, right? Nietzsche anticipated it in his new morality when he said that Ubermensch by force will create a new world. Uh, Foucault codified it when he talks about violence and power in speech. And when philosophers use, use words like power, they're drawing from Marxist and Hegelian understandings of the world, right? And of the way that the world is, that, that it is not something that we receive from a mind, a, um, the mind of God, as Christians have said in the past and, and still to this day, but that it is something that is created by the powerful to oppress and silence those who don't have voices, right? So then the goal of deconstructionists is to find who's silencing who and how can we silence those people to allow people that have been silenced to speak again, all right? And if you are, some of you might be able to begin to put together why this is a, with, why this is a subtle assault on, on classical Christian theism, right? And the heirs to that tradition, the heirs to that tradition, right? Saw societies as structures that utilize language to preserve power, uh, to, to use power to preserve status quo. And that's why critical scholarship becomes so mainstream, right? Many of you guys have, have sat probably, I'm guessing, in anti-racist seminars at work, diversity trainings, those sorts of things where you are taught words that you may or may not say. And the context is you don't want to offend people. And, and there's an element where you shouldn't say certain things out of love for people. But the motivation, that's ulti- the, phil- the philosophy that's ultimately behind that is your words create a world in which those people who haven't historically gotten to speak have to still live, right? And so the reason that you're in those seminars is to teach you how do you use new words to create a different world, okay? That's what's happening in your kind of diversity seminars. I'm not making a value statement on what they are and how they should be, um, but that's, that's where they are. So the goal of critical scholarship is to see how the guy with this bullhorn uses his voice to consolidate power and maintain status quo. Jack reminds his dad, right, that the pencils are real because the essence of a thing are, is rooted in the mind of God. When God said, let there be, that's where the pencil came from. It's not because somebody spoke, somebody else spoke and has created a world. And of course, the ideas are bigger than pencils, right? You guys can follow that. But, but that, that somebody has spoken a, a pencil and a world where a pencil can exist into existence, right? So while the accidents of the world may be different in context, there are true things to be known about this world. And we can, in fact, know them, right? Because the Lord God has indeed spoken, so intersectionality, especially then, tries to find people who are as far away removed from the normal order of things because their voice in that mind is most likely to be objective. If you have not historically had the bullhorn in the world that we live in, we think is oppressive, then maybe we need to give the bullhorn to the person who hasn't had it, 
That's ultimately what critical scholarship and intersectionality is trying to do. Let's find the person who hasn't had a bullhorn and give it to them. But because reality is rooted in the mind of God, we don't have to look for the person with a bullhorn. Instead, we can use reason and revelation to describe and redeem the world. And we can see why intersectionality appeals, however, to so many Christians in the West. The, the doctrine of sin gives us categories to see how people might use power to oppress other people. Because we are sinners, we know, you know what? If I had a bullhorn, I would shout people down and drown them out. Christians think like that. So it's understandable that they would think, yeah, of, of course that's how the world is, right? And, and, and additionally, our ethic of love means that we are required as Christians, right, to care about people who are oppressed and who have been oppressed by an unjust power. We can't escape that. So when, when you look at your neighbors who are holding in and, and leaning into intersectionality, you're like, how in the world does this happen? It happens because Christianity gives us those categories. We think like that, and some people in the academy who are Christians, younger folks especially, are, are buying into that, not because they're not because they don't know the Bible, although that is a serious problem. Uh, it's, it's because it can make sense because most people aren't trying to help them understand the subtle attacks on Christian orthodoxy that it is. And there's a conflict at the intersection I want to highlight where critical theory describes the impact and effect of sin Christians don't need to fear. And insofar as it's descriptive and says, hey, people are sinners, that's not really a problem for me, right? I don't have a problem saying that kind of stuff. But words like systemic, right, if used descriptively, don't need to spook Christians either. What I mean by that is Christians who say, uh, hey, there's been historic patterns of sin that have created a world in which people are sinned against. Christians don't necessarily need to say, ah, I'm not going to use that word either, right? Because our doctrine of sin can give us categories to understand that, right? But, and, and I would offer you this too, there's a lot of freedom in that honesty, Okay? Because if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We do sin, and we sin in patterns, and we have patterns of sin which, which multiply themselves. So there's a lot of freedom in saying, I know that there are people who have historically sinned. We don't have to deny that, that stuff. Uh, so I, I, uh, so I want to move now from, from that description to, uh, and, and that conflict then to say why I don't think Christians can, can assent to it. Because it's one thing to say, yeah, it describes a world that is true, true-ish, but I can't pick up that tool. Michael Polyani, in, uh, in his book, uh, uh, I got the Scientific Knowing, uh, no, Personal Knowledge, excuse me, in his book, Personal Knowledge, says that when someone, he's talking about Maslow's hammer, actually, when somebody picks up a hammer, right, the hammer ceases to be a hammer, right? And it becomes an extension of the will of the person using the hammer. So a hammer laying down can't drive a nail into a wall itself. But when a framer picks it up, and the framer wills to use the hammer to drive the nail, the hammer is an extension of the framer's body to exercise his will. Does that make sense? So when people pick up critical theory, when people pick up intersectionality, what I'm, what I'm going to submit is that we can't pick up those tools because they become an extension of our body, and they deny very critical truths about Christian theism. Okay? And they, they deny very critical realities about the way that the world has been created by God, and I'm going to look at them here, okay? 